The Bellwether Dispatch Week the Fourth Part the Last What it is and what it is not being the same thing. As I sat in the old wooden chair in the little round room of Moonfellow Three, a kind of injury-born stillness overtook me. I have felt this before when ill or wounded, and like a bird shocked from a collision with the window, I have found myself sitting for long hours in one place, hardly lucid, more nothing than something, as the universe wheeled along without me. Sarah Bellwether came and went, fetching her things, as she said. I initially imagined that she'd pop off once and return with some travel bag, but instead she made dozens of little trips, returning each time with a sock or a suit jacket or hat, or some object I could not identify, but all of which struck me as somewhat off, as though she were gathering up all such things that she would never herself use. But each time she returned, she asked me a small question that I could not answer. How was my journey? Where was her mother? Was I quite well? I revived enough at some point to establish my ignorance by claiming a kind of space-faring amnesia. I believe, I said with a great deal of effort, the tremendous force of my travels has rendered me somewhat incompetent of memory. Well then, she said, I shall endeavor to remind you and father that you make a more rapid return to knowing. With that, she left me for a while to dwell in silence. When she returned, this time with a bit of string or wire, she told me that we had never before met, of course, that she was born eight months after I left in the original Moonfellow. Here, I should note, Sarah had begun to make use of a peculiar locution, saying, you and father, when referring to me or him, as though Ronald Vinegar and I were friends of some kind, while also being the same person. My mother told me, Sarah said, that you and father were circling the moon at the time of my birth, and had only just realized that your plan had not been so well thought out, for though you had greatly slowed, and your plan, as you might soon remember, for landing on the moon, was to crash as slowly as possible into it, you instead found that you'd not accounted for some unexpected lunar resistance, a thing that brought you into a kind of soft orbit around your target, and you and father could not, regardless of what you did, get any closer to it. I nodded obligingly, as though vaguely struck by the memory, and she left and returned with a strapped-up pile of books. The plan, Sarah continued, had been for you and father to make a home for us up there on the moon, but because you could not land, you and father and mother decided that she should come to your aid. You had already built moon fellows two and three, and after grappling with this lunar resistance, you began to devise modifications that could be made to these latter rockets, that they might be made stronger somehow to be able to break through the moon's refusal. And with your distant guidance, Mother began to work on Moonfellow too, to fix it in such a way that she might be able to rescue you from Moonfellow One in the upgraded craft that you and she might then descend together to the moon in a ship that could now do so. Sarah left and was gone for some time. In her absence, 
I felt myself beginning to absorb the story movements as points of memory, not as the passing dots of information of another man's life. I felt neither to be the you or the father in this story, but somehow both and neither, which, I suppose, is how I've always felt about being myself, somewhat passably so in sleeves, but equally unconvinced that I was. Sarah returned with a sketch pad and a number of coal pencils, or it was a wooden board and some sticks. Again, I could not say. But regardless, these triggered a thought. Oh, yes, she said, and then patted the green leaded calligraph on the table before me. Of course, you and father typed out your modifications on your calligraph in Moonfellow 1. That is how we communicated. Every Sunday at 6 a.m. as you went about the moon. That was the agreement. And mother would sit in the by and by and convey your messages to our calligraph out there. I was always so terribly excited by the typing chatter of that machine. A new message from you and father. I suppose I looked dumbfounded, as how could I not? So she continued. Mother could not read thoughts, and neither can I, though I do sometimes try. But we can both cast. Sarah seemed to hope that this word, cast, might present some special meaning to me, though of course it did not, and I continued to look askance. Not cast spells, she said. No, we are not witches. But we can commend the energies of people and living creatures, plants and animals and the forces of powered things, one to another, and wreck them as we like. Which is why I had to remain here, for someone always has to cast for the moon fellows. My mother cast for moon fellow one. She was responsible for its launch and any small adjustments, and she kept the living things on board alive and the mechanical things in operation. And then shortly before she left, she relinquished her abilities and passed them on to me, cast them, more like, into my being, that I could then assist her in her departure. I am now at the moment casting, by the way, using your thoughts and a bit of energy from town to get things into line, lighting this room, for example, feeding the plants, starting up the engines below, as you can likely hear. She cast for you and father, and I cast for her. And then, at some point, I was meant to relinquish the magic, but there was no one really left. And it is an awkward and clumsy talent that requires a certain separation from all those who might potentially be one's possible friends and helpers. But regardless my woes, mother cast for you and father, and I cast for her. And here Sarah came in quite close to me, like a cloud closing in on the unfindable parchment of the sky. As I have the great honor of casting for you now, she said, for you and father as you depart in Moonfellow Three. I could hear her struggling in the dimness of the outer cavern, gasping and straining and so on, and I turned to watch as she entered the hatchway door 
with the quiet, shocking beast of a tree. It was about her height and the bearded lattice of its ragged root structure, free of soil, dragged behind her in train. She set the tree down beside me as though it were a prize I'd won. Your orchard, she said, and began to kick a small, insufficient amount of floor dirt over the roots. And indeed, with the leaves nearly overhanging me, I saw the red ornaments of the apples bobbing merrily in the branches. There are blueberries along the wall there, Sarah said, and in the below decks a banana tree and an orange grove. Well, it's not much of a grove, being only one tree, but grove and orchard are such pleasant things to say. Sarah began to say these words to herself, grove and orchard, grove and orchard, in a pretty cycle that drew my attention to their pleasantness, as she slowly put a thoughtful finger to her lips and gazed around at the inventory so far gathered. I should explain it is far from fine, she said, now looking at me, casting, I mean, or being able to, a small, discreet warning, then. For, aside from such specific use, launching rockets and conveying messages, it is in large part a quite forbidding talent. And why both mother and I had the lives we did, remaining so hidden from the many forces, for they are quite overrunning. And why, I suppose, I was never able to find my own replacement, or even search for one. It is not something to bestow upon someone else lightly, being the worst sort of gift, as it is a form of condemnation. But don't think that I have kept myself in perfect isolation. No, I have gone to town, I have gone twice, but what a mess of things I make! She laughed, and departed for some time, returning shortly with what I took to be several pairs of gentlemen's undergarments, but which may have been rags. I am at the mercy, she said, as mother was, of the myriad energies coursing about the ether, the thought of a passing girl, the antic charge of a toaster oven. To be near such things will fill me so with the blue force, and I must dispel it at once, or feel I shall burst. On the days that I have gone to town, the most miserable days being best, freezing, bitter, dark, awful days, to limit my exposure, for hardly anyone is out, yet still the blue force will come, and I will need to discharge it, and so I must cast the force outward upon the world and so make the church bells peal, and the lights in every house twinkle and burn. Alarms are fired, and nothing quite works while overworking. I suppose I laugh at the reeking of such havoc, but it as well makes me quite sad, for such delirious shambles also tells the story of my seclusion, for I cannot be so very close to things and people without inheriting their many charges. But down here we are, we were, I am, I suppose, quite well, in control, as it were, unoverwhelmable, and I can reach out any time I like to gather whatever of the blue force is required, and can cast it where I please, to the moon fellows to keep them well wherever they may be, to the green lights now illuminating us, to this apple tree, to the orange grove, and unto all the little systems on board that need a bit of spinning. She kicked a bit more dirt over the roots of the apple tree, and then proceeded to circulate around the little room, touching at the plants on the floor and wiping at the windows, tidying up as a form of bidding farewell, it seemed to me. And one of the main things that you shall soon remember, I believe, she said, will be the commencement and upkeep of the final postcard service. That will be your main task once aloft, aside from living pleasantly. And so I must ask, will you be well enough, recalled enough, capable enough, 
do you think for that? As well enough, as ready, as capable as a stone, I said nothing. I had not the slightest idea what she was asking, and was now frozen, paralyzed, both by the injury to my foot and the highly fraught and dreamlike quality of the moment. For you may recall, Sarah said, that though no one was quite ready to listen to your talk on revolutionary topics in 1916, it has always been your highest intention to be the sparrow in the treetops. Not a canary in the coal mine, but the sparrow in the treetops, as you like to put it. Singing the song of the beautiful life to be found in flight, in living in the sky, in the above elsewhere of the cosmos. Your always virgin plan had been for this new and final postcard service to present a soft invitation to the world that they might come and join you to let everyone know that life in space, on the moon, wherever you might be, was not only feasible, not just delightful and possible, but inevitable and necessary, to remind us all, just as the adventurers did in the olden days, when they crossed impossible seas and thereby made them possible, while discovering new worlds and thereby making them real, that our outward journey is from nature meant to be a ceaseless undertaking, that we are meant for the stars and ever outward. And with the issuance of this new postcard service, when finally the time was right, you hoped to be as Columbus sending a warm inviting note back home, only to say, I am on my way, I am still alive, all goes well, Send more ships, let us be on our way. Sarah paused here, but it was never quite the right time to begin the service, was it? I did try, of course, as Mother did as well before she departed, to build up a mailing list of sorts, to gather subscribers. But either people weren't interested, or they didn't believe in it, but maybe they are now, and maybe they will. But the question remains, do you still believe in it? Are you and Father ready to answer questions from your curious subscribers and describe what life is like traveling through the stars and perhaps living on the moon if that is the ultimate destination? To be blunt, are you ready to begin the Minor Planet mailing list postcard service? She came and went and came and went, and continued to load the little room with garments and objects, books and bits and little leather boxes containing who knows what. And the last thing she brought was a small wooden chair, which she set down beside me beneath the green leaves of the plants. I'll just set this here, she whispered, and took friendly Geronimo Teddy from my arms and placed him on the bear-like chair beside me. Anna Lee will certainly appreciate it, she said. Of course she is very old now, and possibly dead, and in either case as well beyond any dolly playtime, but still, 
It will mean something. I used to write her whenever one of the children dropped a bear down into the cottage. It made her terribly homesick to hear it, yet she begged me to let her know whenever a new bear arrived. That is how people are, I suppose. She, of course, had no idea what she'd gotten herself into. In fact, a month or so passed before Mother realized she had a little stowaway on board. But her bananas were vanishing at an alarming rate. I tell you it was hard on Annalee, yes, but I think harder on me, for in many ways she replaced me as my mother's daughter, and I suppose I must admit that the two of them grew quite close. So that was painful, and yet they all relied on me to keep things moving, alive, to keep them well, and so that was beautiful. And in so many ways that was the entirety of my life's work. But yet there was a great deal of love that went between us, even across such distances. Just never an embrace, never a warm touch, never any of those small moments of passing plates or cleaning up that don't seem to matter and yet amount to most of what there is. And it had been so many years since I last heard from any of them, until you and father recommenced the last bellwether dispatch, and I knew, I knew it was time for the next rocket to be readied. Sarah had been slowly backing away, and here I saw her hand move to the hatch-like door. She took the handle firmly, and almost began to pull it toward her. Remember to send me a final dispatch once you are away, Sarah said. I will sit in the by and by and cast for it and wait and make sure the postcards are delivered and as well I will let everyone know that the service will be transitioning to the minor planet mailing list and that if they have any questions about your travels they might ask them and that I will cast such notes along to you and report back your answers to them. And if no one writes, still we have a list, and you can simply send your adventurous thoughts. You can begin at least to make way like that. Do let me know how they are when you find them, mother and father and Anna Lee. Of course I am expecting very little, so much time has passed, but who knows what goes on wherever they may be. And finally, please know, that I will keep you well. She began here, ever so slowly, as though turning down a wick's flame, to close the door. So slowly indeed was this process, that in fact she appeared to be pushing it open somewhat wider, as if she wished to enter the rocket, not leave it. It was during this time that I recovered enough sense to stand. My ankle had by now hardened, into a numb bit of wood, and though I limped, I walked without pain. This feeling of numb wood was actually much more thoroughgoing, and spoke to a harboured suspicion I wished not to face, for I was not completely sure that I was still alive, and wondered if perhaps I had died during my fall into the cottage, or was now lodged in the preambling dream that accompanies one's expiration. Regardless, I had no doubt that my own particular role here was not as Sarah supposed. Or perhaps she knew, I cannot say. But seeing me cross toward her, Sarah must have thought I was having second thoughts, and so began to tug with her bird-like might against the door to lock me in, I suppose but I caught her hand and drew her toward me, bringing her small, hardly-touched self into my arms for our second and final embrace. She held me tightly for a moment with a churning kind of struggle, as though planning to hurl me back into the room, but then went quiet. And I drew her back along slowly in a waltz-like way, spinning a bit over our shared small peculiar steps, and finally sat her down in the chair beside the bear. 
I live alone on Market Mountain, I said, in a small cabin by the cliffs, and have for many years. Each day I walk unknown miles through the forest to a new nowhere, and then back home again. Every so often I go into town, the coldest and most miserable days being best. I have said all anyone ever needed to say, and have done the length and breadth and depth of what I meant to do. Or so I thought. I have refused so many things, turned the world away as often as necessary, and not always successfully, hence my role in this last endeavor. But now I would like to say yes to this final bit of watching over. And if you will let me, it would be my last happiness to take on this burden of yours. I would not be chagrined if, as I went here and there on my way, to hear the church bells ringing and the lights in town blossoming. In fact, I would like to wreak a little havoc as I go through town on such dark days when little girls have thoughts and toasters are in use. So I would ask you to allow me the privilege of having this last bit of work that I might keep watch over you, and see you off, and keep you well, and maintain on your behalf this sort of postal office down here, delivering your messages, licking stamps, and all the rest, as you go on your way to find all those you have kept and hardly knew, and surely miss more than anyone else on earth. Sarah acknowledged this in a peculiar way, as a lump of glass absorbing light and unprepared to release it. She stared emptily into herself, as though to speculate on something long wanted, long rejected, for the first time. And then she gazed at me, and trembled all through, and my eyes flickered shut against a kind of brave ocean wind. And when I opened them, I could feel the green light around us pulsing on and off and on and off. And an apple fell from the tree, and the engine quieted, and I felt the numb wood of my ankle breathe out into the fullness of my flesh. And my body woke with a fresh strength that stole up my backside, and a new pulse came to hammer in my chest. And in the long, far-off, unknown distances, I could feel the soft three hearts of Ronald Vinegar and Mary Bellwether and Annalee Cottus, and almost indivisible within my own, I could feel Sarah's. I stepped out and pulled the door shut and raced along the darkened cavern walls which at my insistence now glowed in a cheerful light, until I soon found myself standing on a precipice outside and above the mill as the rocket climbed into the sky and its sound went shaking over the land. The waking villagers in the distant houses broke out in a wild sweat of thought which nearly burst me with its force. I could feel them skipping out over their lawns and fields, and looking up, and shouting out, and wondering with great joy, and bewilderment, and disbelief. And I reached out to take hold of this manic surge of force, awakened by the strange exploding thing twirling away in the sky, and I cast it upward, and the rocket blew out into a new speed and sent down a fresh blast and roar. And it seemed clear to me in that moment how the thing that rose was purely made by the thing that saw it rise, that to behold was, in fact, to create the thing beheld. And yet what innocence there was in this that cause could so little know of its effect. I fell to the ground 
under the pounding surge of blue force as the rocket rose into a drop of light, and all those in town began to reach for it, and in that reaching, all of us went then to old places, Sarah and Ronald and Mary and Anna Lee, and every witness, and myself included, both here and there, shooting away into space, falling back to the earth, staying as we departed, leaving as we remained, reaching for what we did not know. And when the rocket was gone and fully disappeared, and not a single bit of it left to see but the floating memory of its cloud arc, how yet we all continued to stare and seek, as though knowing that here, in the place where there had just been something, there was now something more, and the less it was there, the more we would reach for it. And I closed my eyes and continued to cast the blue force upward toward the oldest woman I had ever known in the only rocket I would ever see. As she headed into infinity, a bear dropped into a hole, a sparrow in the treetops, singing of the joy of the life that could be found in the air above. A song, if we could hear it, that was always merry and bright. Thus concludes the Bellwether Dispatch, and begins the Minor Planet mailing list. And what is that exactly, you may wonder, to which I can only say yes, I myself wonder that too. But here is what I suppose it might be, a very simple way for those on Earth to find out what life is like in space, to find out how Sarah is faring on board the Moonfellow 3, to ask her questions even about the Bellwether Dispatch. The treasure of Amory Snow, for example, is something I myself remain curious about. While I imagine Sarah may herself be forthcoming without the aid of any prompting, I believe she hoped to provide answers to questions from subscribers. To that end, I would like to ask that any queries meant for Sarah be left on a voice mailbox that the audio of such wanderings can be set along Sarah's own answers. The number to leave your questions is as follows. 603-722-0540 I will never answer the phone attached to this number as I have no idea where it is but I can access the mailbox. Yet if you feel shy of that, you may submit your questions to bellwetherdispatch at gmail.com or may write me directly at sherwinsleeves at yahoo.com or can even leave a question on radioghost.com. Each is fine, voice is best, but I'll leave that up to you. These questions will then be cast up put to Sarah via the calligraph, and following that, she will type up her answers on her calligraph, and I will cast them back upon my own. Questions and answers will be laid together in this new audio presentation, which shall bear the name The Minor Planet Mailing List. Stay tuned for the announcement of the grand prize winners when win they do. I thank you for listening, and as I like to say in parting, always merry and bright. P.S. Infinity. <laughs>